Hello and welcome to season two, episode 12 of Dualist Unity. I will be playing the part of Andrew today. And I continue to be the field of limitless possibility that is identifying as Ray for this particular episode. Which version of Ray? We don't know, but it's this version of Ray. That much is enough. Episode 12 version. I like it. <laughs> but yeah, so we, per usual, having a conversation and we were like, all right, let's get going. Um, so I was just talking about how recently I've been able to more easily tap into other people's perspectives and kind of see their vantage point. I think I mentioned this a couple episodes about how when I was with my dog a lot, my family's dog, when I was down in Tampa for a couple of weeks, I was able to see the world through her eyes. Like uh, my eyes were open and I was, you know, going through things, but I, I could imagine her perspective and her looking at Andrew and it was fascinating. And so I do that more and more on the street, walking around New York. Like I can tap into like someone else's point of view, looking at me as we're passing. And I was just telling Ray more recently, I've been able to kind of feel what they're feeling and then have a sense of the, I don't know if it's based on their body language. I can, it's like a guess of what they're feeling or what, but, but we were just talking about how the, the idea of ego and how, if, if they are even separate, even that idea. And it made me wonder, like being able to feel people's feelings a little more. It's like, we're all feeling the same feelings. We just have an idea of ourself that's feeling it, but it's all the same awareness experiencing itself and maybe the same ego thinking that it's not it, but I really want Ray's point of view. <laughs> that's a really interesting question, right? Because it kind of makes you wonder about the phenomenon of ego and if it, in fact it is a shared experience, but it's kind of like um, a pool of water that's covered with, uh, with oil. You have all different kinds of colors on that pool of water, right? It's one pool, but every part of it is experiencing that, that pool in a, different, in a different way. And so is it, is it one phenomena of ego? Is it, you know, is it one phenomena of gravity that each planet is, is expressing? Is it one phenomena of ego that each of us is expressing? It's a really interesting question, but what's interesting to me is that there are people and I know I've had this conversation in the past that not everybody who claims to be one is one, but there are people who are empathic. There are people who can feel other people's feelings without actually talking to those people. And often those people are hypersensitive because of early life trauma, right? Because they've had to become hypersensitive in order to deal with their reality or, or, or in order to survive as it were. And so they end up actually picking up the feelings of other people and they would call themselves empaths. Now, a lot of people, they'll, they'll say that I'm an empath. Every time I'm down, it's because of somebody else who's feeling it. And then that's a different story that ends up becoming an ego trip, right? But there is a level of sensitivity where you can feel the tapestry. You can feel the ripples off of each and every person, right? So that can get super intense. Now, what's interesting, and I was talking about this the other day because I came from a traumatic background and I had a history of, of almost every experience being, um, how do I put this, hyper intense. It, it was always just, you know, stark abandonment or humiliation or loneliness. Like it was always intense, intense experiences that stuck out in my memory. And from that, I became empathic. I became more easily able to empathize with other people without even necessarily knowing about their story. But it was so intense that I couldn't deal with it. And so I started blocking that stuff out. And I started blocking it out at first through ego. And as my journey continued, I started understanding what my ego was. I started understanding self-definition and all of that and this, this entire conversation. And so since waking up, I've realized exactly how much of that sensitivity I've blocked out for my own benefit, for my own sense of, of being in order to maintain some equilibrium. And so I've used what we would indicate as a, a cerebral conversation as a way of picking my way through the walls that I built up to protect myself from those feelings, to kind of work them away slowly as I could understand them, to uh, slowly open myself up to that sensitivity again. And that's what's happening, that that's the whole thing. And I find this really interesting because as you let go of your walls, as you let go of your idea of yourself, you become empathic. You become more easily able to empathize with 
other people, quote unquote, other people. And it's because you can recognize yourself within them. And in Power Versus Force by Hawkins, I think it's really interesting because he talks about a certain point of your path where you will stop doing this linear sequential uh, processing of information that we're so used to doing. Like you meet somebody, you pick up a clue from their body language, which means this, which could mean this, which could mean this. And your brain goes through this entire sequential logical processing to give you an idea of who they are. After a certain point of getting out of your own way and allowing yourself to feel sensitivity, you don't process like that anymore. And admittedly, that's not how I, I experience the world anymore. I don't run across a person and then go through that sequential process of trying to understand them. It's more like a whole recognition. All of a sudden, it's just bam, and you have a recognition of this person's being. And then everything kind of unpacks from there in a conceptual way. But the recognition comes first, as opposed to following that linear sequential path to try and establish an idea. And I find that super interesting because if we're not talking about the emergence of our actual hyper intelligent being self, what are we talking about? Right. So empathy and sensitivity and, and intelligence, they all go kind of hand in hand. I, I find it just fascinating that you're experiencing this as you continue down this path. And I also find it really interesting that it coincides with your recent um, interaction with the Harry Krishnas. Yes, that is a fun story. I'll, I'll tell that in a sec. But for me, it seemed like when you say like, like, bam, and, and it's just there instead of this sequential sort of thing. When you were saying that, I, I was thinking it from the perspective of the recognition that you are them is sort of that bam. And then it's like, it's all there. It's not like you are a separate thing from them that can only parse through that situation that they're experiencing or, or you know, seeing things through their eyes, but it's through your eyes in their eyes, you know? So it's, it's like, because of that separation, there's not that snap of the finger recognition, but because there is no, you don't have any walls. You're not seeing over any walls. There's, there's just, there, there's no walls on the other end of it for them either. And it's just seamless integration, but yeah. So the, the, is it the Hari, Hari Krishnas? Yeah. So I'm curious, cause I haven't really looked them up too much. So I, I'm curious after I say this, like what their whole story is. Cause I know Ray has some experience with them, but I was walking around uh, this weekend. I was actually, I took a little, some mushrooms uh, tripped on uh, was it Saturday and I was just walked around for, for hours. And so this is towards the end and I was walking through the park uh, near me and there was a group of them and I didn't know what they were. It just looked like a bunch of monks in robes and I'm walking by, I have my dualistic unity white sweatshirt on established now and i'm just walking past kind of looking at them wondering like what's going on one of them is trying to pass out pamphlets and i actually have it right here just so i uh remembered to talk about this and tell this story and uh so he sees my sweatshirt and he's like oh do dualistic unity dualistic unity and i was like yeah you, you like it you, you get it yeah and he's like yeah and i'm like yeah i am you and he's like yeah I am you. I am you. And I was like, hell yeah. And then we, we gave each other a big hug and he was like so excited. And it was awesome. Cause it was just like the universe awareness experiencing itself, recognizing itself. And then we chatted for a little bit and I was like, yeah, this is my podcast. You might, you might actually like it. You should check it out. And so then he had all these pamphlets and I was like, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll take it. So, uh, and yeah, and then kept walking and, and that was it. But it was a really cool interaction. So yeah, Ray, I'm curious of, of your understanding of, of them and if uh, that sort of recognition by them and myself made sense given their sort of story, I guess. It absolutely makes sense because so the, the Hare Krishnas, and I might not be uh, pronouncing that correctly, but it, it kind of uh, is a deviation from uh, Hinduism in that um, it's kind of the same thing. We're all one, as it were. Um, they specifically believe that through the sound or the vibration of the mantra itself, through the, the word or the name of God um, being repeated over and over again, they are subjecting themselves to the vibration of the universe, that they are subjecting themselves and whoever hears it to a purifying spiritual vibration. And so they have one mantra uh, that I think is like, Ari Krishna, Ari Rama, 
Rama, Krishna, and again, and it goes on, but it's basically just Are, Rama, and Krishna are the three words. And, and of course, um, Hare, I, I believe, is like the, the recognizer of the illusion, so, so the ego, the observer, right? And then uh, Krishna and, and Rama would be the allness, the Godhead, right? So they're basically talking about unity and duality, which I thought was just perfect, <laughs> considering they saw it. I can understand why your sweater would have caught his attention. Um, now, going back, because we can talk about the fact that it's a belief and that there are certain things that they hold on to, uh, such as the idea that like, they won't eat meat because to them, whatever they're eating is a consciousness that they're bringing into their own body. Now, it's not just what they eat, but also who prepares it. So often they won't eat at a restaurant, for example, because they don't know whose consciousness they're eating. So there's that. And then there's the idea that when they die, the last thing that they're thinking about indicates or, or um, creates the next incarnation that they're going to be experiencing. So there's a certain degree of belief and control in there. There's a certain degree of ego, for sure. But you can see how the foundational uh, insight behind it is very, very similar. But again, it becomes a mantra that you have to repeat. It becomes a thing that, that locks you in place rather than allowing you to be the insight that you're talking about, right? So, but given how few filters are in the way, like there's no real purity tests outside of, you know, don't eat meat and try to enjoy everything as, as being God or consciousness. What was your feeling in meeting that person? Because I know years ago, I had the opportunity to go to a uh, religious convention where they had a, uh, a leader from seven different religions all coming and meeting and having a discussion on the nature of suffering. And I had a, a specific, a specifically different energetic reaction to each and every one of those speakers based on, on the, the mentality that they embody. So I'm just wondering, what was your reaction to, to the gentleman that you met uh, representing Hare Krishna? Yeah, it was, I mean, to be, to be fair, I was, I was coming down from a mushroom trip, but it was absolutely, I think that might've made me more sensitive to the vibration, probably if anything. Um, but yeah, it, it was very much like very little walls were up, I guess the best way that I can describe it. Like I didn't ask for his name, but it almost like it didn't even matter in that, in that way. Um, but yeah, it was, it was fun too. Cause he, he like reached out to hug me and I was like, hell yeah, like bring it in. And, and it was just like a very loving kind of very much a deeper connection, even though we talked for, you know two minutes, maybe it was very brief, but like deeper than many interactions I've, I've had recently. And I actually wanted to ask you, so with, and I figured because it was like, you know, they're handing out pamphlets, there is some sort of belief going on. I figured it wasn't like just pure awareness happening there. Um, but with, uh, with the not eating meat, because of the energy vibration, I heard someone talking about why they're, they don't eat meat, they're vegan or vegetarian or something. And because they think that, you know, the food you consume is a sort of energy and an animal, maybe, maybe not in being killed, it was in a state of fear or something. They were, they were explaining something like that, but then also it's, it's upbringing and its existence. If it's in, you know, some of the terrible conditions that especially chickens and cows in the U S exist in these days. Uh, there's just a very, uh, sort of like low vibration, I guess that you're consuming. What are your thoughts on that? Because I feel like part of it kind of makes sense, but like a lot of things, they probably take it to an extreme in a way was my sort of sense, but there is a piece that I'm kind of like, yeah, that, that does make sense if we're all energy and and those cells are embodying a sense of vibration that's that's lower but how much impact does that have on us you know if we recognize that we're not this ego or idea that's consuming it that's nice where i said. got to yeah how much impact does what we're eating have on us versus how much impact do we have on it Right. And so the idea that what we're eating affects us is, isn't a new one. I mean, uh, indigenous tribes have believed that for thousands of years, even going so far as to, as to think that eating a certain type of animal would give you certain traits of that animal for a certain period of time. And, and this is an old belief for sure. So obviously there's got to be something um, that, that would have triggered that belief. There's an ounce of truth behind every story. Right. So um, I know that 
in hunting an animal that you kill that's tense or stressed, it's harder to eat, right? And obviously we know that a person's energy in a, in a life of stress and in an environment that, that's not conducive to, to being healthy or alive or, or free um, creates toxicity in the body, creates cancers and sicknesses for us, which if anybody was eating us would transfer over to them, right? And so that's all true, it's absolutely true, which is why I've often said that while I am not a vegan, I do not believe uh, or I, I do not agree with factory farming. I do not agree with the entire industry of farming as it currently exists. But, um, you know, farms that are run more traditionally where the animals have a life, they, they can actually graze, they, they live a good long time, the family loves and knows them. Um, there's some respect in the process when they are going to be killed or when they die. Um, that, that all makes a difference in a big way. It's funny because my wife will often uh, do Reiki on her meat before we eat it um, because if she knows it's bought for us from a store. And if it's a particular type of meat that we couldn't get from a local vendor, especially, she will immediately do energy work on it. Um, whereas my perspective is I'm eating it. That is the energy work. I am Reiki. Like everything about my being is a purification of everything that's going through me. And that includes what I'm eating. It includes the room that I'm in, the house that I live in, the neighborhood that I, that I exist within. I carry that ripple with me because that's what we are. We are energy all the time, right? And so as much as we're affected by the world, we are the world, which you and I have said many times. And, and it really comes down to how much responsibility are we willing to take for how much this thing is affecting us, right? There is an influence for sure, but how much? And, and I think that that very much does come down to what we're doing uh, internally, if you want to say internally, but what we're doing within our awareness, what we're doing in terms of that division between ourselves and reality, because just like our meat is going to suffer by the fear that it experiences, so will our ability to process that meat be influenced by the fear that we experience. So it's almost like, I'm curious if someone is of that mindset that they're going to be impacted by the vibrations, if they are afraid of that they're embodying a state of fear so it's like bam double whammy versus if you and it like kind of comes back to faith in yourself in a way it's like how much do you embody the understanding that nothing can impact you so much as you are like you are like ray just said the purity test and it's uh it's very interesting. And, and coming back to that idea that if you do believe that that can have an impact on you and that negative vibration of something that was in a state of fear when it died or had existed in suffering throughout its life, and then now you're eating it, it's like, how much faith do you really have in yourself if you think that that can have an impact on you? And I don't know, is that your perspective on maybe not all nutrition, but to a degree is like, because so many people, especially these days get caught up in like, they won't eat certain, I don't know, even like, I'm curious, like I hear about the red, red dye, like red five, stuff like that. That's like, or, or any sort of chemical that sometimes it's illegal in some countries and then like legal in the U S and it's like, seems kind of messed up that it's that way. But do you think that those don't have as much impact if you don't think that they will and, and you recognize that they don't have to, or is it still that there's going to be some impact because they are quote unquote dirty or harmful chemicals? Because there's a lot of that these days that people get so caught up in those ideas. And it's like, how much will it, how much impact will it actually have, or, or are you making the impact worse by thinking that it will be a negative impact? Yeah, and if you didn't know it was there, what would be the impact then, right? Because stressing about it is is making it easier for it to influence your body. It's it's lowering your immune system. It's lowering the, the healthy functioning of your body, which makes it more difficult to deal with everything, right? But it really just again it comes down to balance, but. If we're going to talk about this, then we have to talk about the reality of what we're saying, because if we're going to start worrying about certain things within our food, we have to start worrying about certain things within our earth. Um, you know, microplastics are, are a perfect example or uh, the chemical used to make Teflon 
It's a perfect example. Teflon, um, the material or the chemical used to make Teflon has been around since the Second World War. Um, it is used in everything from frying pans to uh, carpets. And it is a chemical your body cannot break down. It's the equivalent of eating a rubber tire. Your body can't break it down and it's ubiquitous it's everywhere in reality right now in the same in the same way that um, antidepressants have been measured within fish in the great lakes right so there are chemicals that are so rampant in our world that it's affecting everything we eat everything we breathe everything we drink and our body is processing all of that so if we're going to start worrying about one we better start worrying about them all um, but the fact is, is that that wouldn't do us any good. As we just said, worrying actually makes it harder for our body to deal with it. So what we have to do is we have to start realizing all of those consequences are the same egotistical consequence just played out over a longer time under the veil of capitalism and invention. Um, and we have the same responsibility of what am I going to think? What am I going to uh, in, ingest into my body? How aware am I of everything that I'm in, involved with? And, and that's a big deal. It's just about awareness. But there's that balance between awareness and fear. Being aware of a problem and being afraid of that problem are two different things, right? Being aware allows you to, to cha change your decisions. Being afraid might also allow you to change your decisions, but there's a bigger consequence in that you're doing harm to yourself to make that decision. Right. So that, that's the whole thing. But when it comes down to it, and, and I've thought about this a lot, the chemicals that we are just inundating the world with that affect everything um, at this point, from the water to the air and upwards that are flooding through our bodies all the time, like even uh, just the wrappers that they use at Subway or McDonald's or fast food restaurants and even some grocery stores, those wrappers have been found to have the chemical that's in Teflon to keep the grease from getting into them. So it, our food is wrapped in this stuff. There's an article on this that was just uh, recently re released. So if we know we're being poisoned and we can't stop it necessarily without leaving society or, or radically changing society, then it just comes down to our own individual choices. And it comes down to not panicking, allowing your body to have what it needs to heal and flush itself out, which means, you know, take care of yourself love yourself. And if you can love yourself, you'll start to do things that do take care of you. You'll work out a bit more. You'll, you'll eat better food or you'll, you'll take more time to prepare something for yourself, which is interesting because it goes back to the whole Hare Krishna thing, right? Whoever's preparing their food is the consciousness that they're going to be ingesting. So when you prepare your own food, even if it is junk food, right? If you can just put a little more attention and awareness into the preparation, maybe make a salad on the side or whatever, just Put your enthusiasm and your focus into the act of eating instead of just shoving it down your gullet, trying to, you know, make it to the next satis satisfying uh, indulgence, right? Then that attention, that awareness is going to change your appreciation for the meal. It may actually change how you enjoy or taste the meal, which may change how you choose to have your next meal. It always just comes down to the same thing, awareness in the here and now. But again, that means being aware of the consequence we're causing ourselves. And that's all internal. Yeah, that brings up another point I just find fascinating about how much in our societies we just rush around to the next thing. And it's like it's like a disease almost. And it's incredible to have the recognition of it. And just I guess when you recognize that you are eternity, it's like all you really need is to be aware because because your eternity so awareness of the here and now the eternal now that's it it's not the next thing to the next thing to the next thing to the next thing because that is all super egotistical it's all accomplish this to build up the sense of self accomplish this to build up the sense of self and we're so caught up it just comes back full circle to our idea of our, ourselves and and the thought that we are this idea we are this ego we are this self and in the recognition that you're not and this actually leads me to something else i want to bring up so i tripped this weekend with a friend and we got into like different random conversations and uh we we're talking about simulation theory, whatever. And I was like, kind of brought up Ray's point that 
you know, even if it is a simulation, like they'd all still be identifying as I and me. So it's like, is it really a simulation? And my friend <laughs> responded because I had mentioned the whole like everyone identifying as I and me like a few times. And she was like, you're you're really caught up on this whole I and me thing. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, it's pretty fucking wild, isn't it? And she was like, yeah, but like, I don't know. It's kind of like once once you get it, it's like keep keep moving. Right. And I was like, not if you not if you get it, though, like if you if if you think of it as just a thing that you get and then you keep moving, then it's just a concept, I felt like. And I kind of expressed that. And I didn't I wasn't like <laughs> I didn't say something, you know, like <laughs> you think like that, you're you're not getting it. You know, I wasn't going to be an asshole, but um yeah, it was kind of clear that if you, because it can be very conceptual. And for me, it was a long time before last year. It was like, oh yeah, I am the universe. Like I, as Andrew, am the universe. Andrew isn't separate from the universe. And it's like, no, that the idea of Andrew is the separation. That's the idea of separation is that you are Andrew. So in that recognition, it's just like, <sighs> It's, yeah, there, there's just a lot of depth to it. And I think it's fascinating to see, see it expressed and, and recognizing that you're not, that idea just makes things so much clearer in a way and, and helps in so many different avenues that I think when it comes to fear or worry or, or anything like that, there's, it's just so much more clarity in those recognitions and so many, like, if not all of our problems are rooted in that idea that we are what we think we are and we are separate in any way. It's not easy to deal with though. And that's the thing we, we want to wrap it up. I had uh, somebody respond to a, a video I made recently about if you were to look at, at a single cell within the body suddenly having the insight that its awareness was the entire awareness of the body of just being expressed through itself you would get very close to the jesus message which is that we're all one right somebody responded on reddit that i'm arrogant and that you know this is why do you have to go over complicating you know love your neighbor as yourself it's 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 very simple it's very straightforward you're just you know posturing and it's like but it's not straightforward because there's a very big difference between treat people the way you want to be treated and recognizing that we're all one awareness. There's a very big difference between treat people the way I prefer, right? Versus they're all me. One is ego and the other one is empathy. But we want to wrap it up in a concept because then we don't have to look at it. We don't have to keep looking at it. And so whenever I've ever heard that uh, response and I have many times over the years, like, oh, well, that's all straightforward. Why do we have to keep talking about this? It's like, is it? Okay, so you're everybody, right? Yeah, perfect. How about that person that abused you as a child? Conversation's over. And it's over because I don't want to see them as me. And that's why we've stopped going down that rabbit hole, right? And it's, that's the point, is that it's an insight that is only limited by your self-imposed limitations right? By your need to define, by your need to hold back, by your need to pump those brakes. That's the only thing that limits that insight of exactly how much this is you. And that's, that's the whole point, right? So when somebody's just like, oh, it seems very straightforward and cut and dry. It's like, does it? Maybe we should ask why. Why does it seem so straightforward? Let's, let's, let's delve into that a bit. And you'll realize that it's straightforward because it would be uncomfortable for it to not be. Yeah. Yeah. That, that makes sense. Cause I, I, I think too, if I had pushed it a little and brought up some situations or something, it, it, there's certain ones that they're going to strike a chord and it's gonna end just like you mentioned that example. And it's going to bring them away from that recognition. Cause like, it's not straightforward it is if you want to just say it like, Oh yeah. Everyone identifies as I and me. It's like, yeah, cool. And, and so when it comes also, you mentioned the idea of, of your preferences and things like that. And I actually saw a video that was kind of related to this today. And it was talking about like 
ascending and like winning the game of life and ascending into another dimension and blah, 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 all that, all that other bullshit. But it was talking about how in order to win this game of life, and this is actually a guy that I follow, I, I'll send you the video after, right? But it was, uh, it was talking about how in order to win the game of life, you have to love more than you hate or like act like be it was basically just saying like be nice more than you're not nice in order to win the game of life and it was just such like a uh, it was so such a strange video that was just not deep at all it was so surface level of just and it's like first of all who the fuck is telling you this like where did you hear this is this or is this just something you randomly came up with like why is it 50 percent or you know, why is it like half and half? Like you really are going to be a shitty person 50% of the time. And it's just, it's the conceptual level. It's kind of like the difference between morality and empathy. It's like recognizing that you are everyone act accordingly versus you are not everyone. You are separate. Follow these rules. Be nice because you want to achieve this accomplishment that's super fucking egotistical. Like that's kind of what it is. It's like so egotistical because you want to ascend. You as this individual separate idea of self want to ascend or want to win the game of life. And it's like, there's so many holes that you can poke in that. And, and just, just the idea of yourself, like what you are, like you don't have a name. Your idea of yourself is rooted in the past. You're, the awareness of what is right now. What else are you? Your environment is impacting this grouping of cells. This grouping of cells is impacting all of the groupings of cells outside of its skin. It doesn't have a name. It doesn't have a past and it doesn't have a future. So what are you again, that's going to win this game of life that is separate from life somehow that, that could possibly win the game of life because you're not life. Like, where there's so many disconnects there that are just fascinating. It's like, be nice 50% of the time and you win the game. It's like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, where does that even come from? I don't know. But have you, I don't know. Have you heard stuff like that? Oh, in for sure. Relation? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. And, and it is, it's very much, it's an egotistical thing. And see, this is where uh, Suzanne, who was on our, our show four episodes ago or, or so, um, had a really relevant point that, because there is no end result, there is no end goal to awareness, to existence, right? There's no preference, right? Like, it's not that the universe wants you to love people. Realities will always be, right? It doesn't, it doesn't have a preference because it's everything from both ends of the spectrum and everything in between, right? And so in that case, Suzanne was correct, right? Like, words were said as it were, right? But that removes the fact that we are the whole. So what you're saying is that that perspective is really based on us thinking about ourselves as a very small piece of the whole. Winning the game of life as me, as this you know, piece on the Monopoly board. And what you're saying is, but you're the whole board and the table the board is on and the room, <laughs> like you're, you're all, of, how do you win if you're the whole game, right? And so it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. But once you are the whole game, then you end up start realizing I'm the rudder, right? Like if there's nothing to win, but I can change direction. There's no destination, but it's just one long voyage that lasts forever, forever. That's the beauty, the beauty of being eternal life, right? And so everything we do creates an impact that creates a ripple that changes the direction of our collective ship, as it were, and because we're not separate. So the idea of how do you win life is so short-sighted because you are life. The real question is, how do you enjoy yourself in every facet of what you truly are? How do you really get out of your way and allow life to be free so you can truly be free? But that means you have to let go of the prison that you're defining yourself with. Yeah, it's, uh, there's so much of that. Like it's, it's like the entire self-help motivational industry is like there's so much ego and yeah the need for for money and to make profit off of people's insecurities basically it's what it comes down to it's it's wild and it's 
it's like, I don't know how, because even, even my friend saying like, oh, you're really harping on this idea of, of I am, I and everyone's identifying as I and me, like how many people do you think, and it's funny even saying like other people and, and so like, what do you think it is? Like, how do you describe it as the universe experiencing itself? And, and we are all the same thing. Is it just that pieces of itself or, or perspectives of existence have forgotten that they're it or, you know, can't remember or just have so much veil of judgment and, and self-perception they can't see through it it's like so fogged up by that or they just have so much societal conditioning that it can't I can't see myself and see that I am what is like we like how do you describe someone who doesn't recognize that they are existence experiencing itself is it a forgetting thing or, or there was a really good ever... question and and yeah. it, it's a lot of things right because i mean okay so so let's just look at it in terms of, of uh, fields of possibilities okay so you have unity at one end and then you have everything that that from duality onward from the original split into two to three to five to seven and it just keeps going right so you have this infinite amount of, of dualistic variations of one unitary being okay well, you would have a smaller amount of variations that were closer to the unity than you would have of the amount of variations that were farther out in duality. That makes sense, right? Immediately, you would have more variations of duality than you would have reflections of unity because there are only so many variations of unity before it starts splitting into farther and farther aspects of duality. So the majority of our expressions in this dualistic universe are divisive. The majority, because they are by by design, not design, design is not the right word, but they are by necessity of their place within the spectrum of what could be. And so when I run across people who are there in that place where they think they're separate and they're totally wrapped up in their own story and everything else, I see myself, but I see myself hammering my head against a wall I don't understand is the inside of my own skull. All right. And that's very much it, is that they're just like us, but their reality is so much more constricted to what they can imagine it is. And so all we're really doing when we're breaching that conversation is we're, we're reminding them that the idea they have of reality is not reality itself. We're just allowing them to make a crack in that wall, right? As we are. Now, see, that's this the thing is after a certain point, the cracks start to get bigger and you start going, shit, there's light out there. And you start just hammering on the walls. You're like, I, I can see it now, right? But up until, up until that point, the walls are your reality. They're everything that you know, right? And so when I run across those people, I try to remember that. And, and it's very much like Plato's cave, which we had talked about before, right? And as soon as you go back in the cave, everybody starts judging you on your ability to see the shadow puppets on the wall rather than your ability to see the world because they've never seen the world, right? And this is where that empathy thing comes in. But what's interesting is that it's like the expression, you know, all, all roads lead to Rome. <laughs> um, the more you are in that state of mind, the more you recognize that state of mind or recognize that, that beingness that you are, however you'd like to describe it, the more roads you see to get there. And so it doesn't matter what the, co the topic is. It doesn't matter where you start in the conversation. There's always some way to get back to that insight that is the here and now, always. But people make the mistake in thinking, and this is the problem with belief as a whole, um, that we got to get people from where they are to God in like one step. It's like, but they are God, right? All, you're, all you have to do is just help them start to, to recognize that the revelation of their own limitless potential is the path right? That's it. And then that path is ongoing. It's, it just keeps unfolding for the rest of their existence, right? But going back to this idea that winning the race of life, it's like everybody has the same finish line. <laughs> we all have the same finish line biologically, right? And in terms of awareness, there is no finish line. 
right? So all we're ever doing is, is talking to people and, and in my opinion, from my experience, sharing that freedom with them. I don't even tell people that they're the reality of, uh, or the awareness of reality anymore for the most part. I don't talk to people about God and, and everything else. I just hang with them with nothing I need, nothing needed from them. And that allows them to feel a little bit more free. And then that's, that's, all, I, that's all I need to do. That's all they need to do. Because once they start to feel that, then they're going to want more of it. As they start to want more of it, they'll start to realize they're in their own way. And the path is ongoing from there. Yeah, that's that in itself, I feel like is a freeing realization. Just like for myself, is that you don't have to <laughs> express it or explain it to anyone. Though I do enjoy figuring out ways to do that at times also. And it's more so just the, being the embodiment of freedom and recognizing when there are situations. I see this sometimes with I'll say people close to me where there's something that happens and people are starting to get stressed. And it's like being able to recognize that that stress, just that act of being stressed about the thing that happened is that's sort of the issue. It's not the thing that you're perceiving to be the issue. So just being able to remain relaxed and sort of show that, you know, freaking out and getting stressed doesn't actually change the thing that happened. And it's not actually going to change what happens moving forward. And I filmed a video uh, just like an hour ago on my walk. I haven't posted it yet about just shame and, and guilt and the idea that it doesn't help anyone. Like feeling shame, ashamed, feeling guilty doesn't help a single person, but you think that you deserve it. You think that, you know, you and, and because you're judgmental of yourself and think of the way that you acted as shameful or guilty, you think that you have to feel this as like a way to like punish yourself and recognizing that it doesn't help anyone. It doesn't help yourself. It doesn't help anyone that you acted maliciously towards, but in feeling ashamed and guilty, you're only reinforcing that you are the person that acted in that way. And you're not simultaneously changing in that feeling of guilt and shame. You're just feeling guilty and ashamed and reinforcing identity and reinforcing ego and reinforcing that you are someone who would act like that. And so what should you do instead? Just act differently moving forward. Just, just recognize what happened and keep moving forward because you can't change the thing that happened. You can't, you know, it's in the past and that's it. Like just recognizing you can't change it. And then recognizing that feeling guilty and shamed about it isn't necessary. And so many people think that it is, they'll say like, Oh, well, if I don't feel ashamed. Then how am I going to change? That's like, bro, that's like serial killer mentality. And it's like, there are so few people that have that ability to compartmentalize something that they did and not feel a certain way about it or recognize it's not even feeling bad about it helps. It's like just recognizing that there were consequences to that action. So there aren't feelings that have to go along with that. It's just acting differently moving forward and so yeah, that was that was a uh, interesting. I forget why I started with that little story, but that was uh, something I came to today. Just like kind of hit me while I was walking. And it's interesting, right? Because I mean, guilt and shame are very egotistical, right? Like it's it's not an act of empathy. It's so much as I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm not living up to the expectations that I'm supposed to be living up to, and so I feel bad. I'm judging myself, right? Whereas empathy is, you know, well, what if I, what if it was me, I did that too? How would I feel if I treated myself this way, or if somebody treated me this way? And all of a sudden, there's that recognition, right? And you're all, oh, and you could feel bad, or you could just take that for what it was, because it immediately changed you. That's the point. Right. It immediately changed you. I knew somebody when I was in uh, when I was a teenager who used to get in fights all the time. 
all the time because he was a big dude and and people would just like cower and he would he would just hit them and, and so he dominated for years and then one day he ended up getting into a fight against someone smaller and they just cleaned his clock and uh he walked away going it really hurts to get hit it's like exactly because nobody had ever hit him he had always won every fight because of his size and so all of a sudden he recognized what he had been doing to other people he never hit another person he just stopped right and that's that's the case right empathy is is different than morality i made a video about this on tiktok uh, uh, very recently that empathy is the genuine article, whereas morality is just a poor substitute that the ego tries to, to abide by so it can judge its progress and compare itself to other people. And, and that's that whole thing. It's so interesting because uh, power versus force, again, I can't recommend this book enough. Um, the chart within it is, is so um, useful in, in terms of insight because you can recognize where apathy and guilt and shame and desire and anger are all based on our self-identity are all based on our self-image and our perceived needs right? and then pride again identity except that this is the, the positive end of, of identity when everything's going well right that's our highest energy level and i love how they demonstrate that all of these different states of mind as we increasingly shed the self-image that they're dependent on become a greater and greater source of energy for us that's the point. Every time we shed another layer of our, of our self-imposed prison, we feel more freedom. We feel more potential, more energy. And that's all that chart is, is really laying out. But then it goes on to tell you, like, this is logarithmic change. This isn't like, you know, 201 is one point more than 200, right? Like, we're looking at an exponential growth in terms of how much energy is available as we continue on. And then they say, like, at 200, you're in the state of courage where now you're not doing it for your, your identity. You're not doing it for self-image. You're doing it because this is what life is, carrot or stick, regardless. Life is just moving forward, which leads to acceptance and so on. But what's mind blowing about all of this is that for anybody who's listening, who is wrestling with or has wrestled with guilt and shame and desire and all of that stuff, and you've left that behind, you can feel how much better you feel in your life. You can feel that much more energy. That's all under the 200 mark. And the, and the scale goes to 1,000. And it's, again, exponential growth in terms of potential and limitation or, or lack of limitation. So you have to remember, like, there's so much more than even what we're experiencing right now. And I say this 20 years into the journey, consistently questioning everything that's ever made me comfortable and made me want to stop. And... It just keeps getting more and more fun. It just keeps getting more and more awe-inspiring because everything that you once considered to be reality is no longer there. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense to you the way it used to. The idea of being an idea no longer makes sense. And you start to feel like you are flying for lack of a better way to put it. It feels like you're free. And that feeling of freedom just keeps getting more and more and more enjoyable and more and more intense. But you have to work your way to, out of your prison. You have to work your way out. You have to start thinking about it and being aware of it. And as you become aware of it, you start realizing how to take it apart. And as you start taking it apart, that's when you get your wings. Yeah. And uh, for me, especially recently, the recognition that like I don't have a name and like I'm not my name and I'm not this story. Like I very often forget that I'm Andrew, you know, it, it's getting harder and harder almost to remember that. And just with that, there's so many layers to it and the consistent questioning of what I think I am or what I think I can or can't do or can or can't accomplish. And, and also the recognition that I don't have to judge myself along the way. Like it happens as it does and it's cumulative, like it all builds on itself that it gets easier and easier to exist and harder and harder to remember what it was like to think that you were something separate from anything and anyone and that you are that you thought for a while that you were an idea is like there's so much freedom in that and it's i think so jarring at first because we're so used to that 
and, and have found ways to cope with an existence that we are so sure of is that way. So like you said, with, with the idea of pride is like the, the higher energy form of, of ego taking place. And for a lot of people, that's where they find their energy and where they find their good feelings. But there's so much beyond that. And there's so much more freedom beyond that because there's not, I feel like there isn't really freedom in that state, right? It's like, it feels good, but it's very limited to how much you can feel good about yourself and how much validation you can get from other people who think they are that person and they see you as something else than them. So it's just like so egotistical and, and to get caught up in that, I feel like can very much restrict you. I don't know. It it almost seems like sometimes when you're the, the difficult times and the suffering are the opportunities to see beyond and kind of jump over a vibration of, of pride and, and just recognize that you're not what you think as you're suffering through something can be very much a bridge and a situation that people would typically label as terrible or bad or whatever, or difficult, then if you're able to recognize that it's like, are those situations really that terrible? Like I've had situations where I'm going through and I don't feel great. And I'm, you know, worrying about a bunch of stuff. And then I recognize that I'm not any of those things that I'm worrying about. So it's like, was that situation actually bad that I was going through? Or it's like, no, it was just a step along that recognition. It was, it was necessary potentially in order for me to remember or recognize that I'm none of those things. But without that suffering, maybe it would have been a lot more difficult. If you're feeling prideful all the time, maybe it's more difficult because you don't want to get rid of that feeling. You want to keep that feeling around. So that's interesting too. (laughs) Rich man getting into the kingdom of heaven, right? Yeah. That's it. And, And it's interesting because at pride, you're not free right? Because at at pride, you're still living by value by comparison. How much have you accomplished? How much do you have versus how much does everybody else have? How much have they accomplished, right? Not only that, but what if you lose all that? What if all of your accomplishments suddenly mean nothing or you lose your job or your house gets taken away or the market falls? All of a sudden, all of your source of energy is gone. All your source of value, all your source of meaning is gone, right? And that's that, that, uh, that whole expression that pride goeth before the fall. Right. And that, that's exactly it. Because if you're using accomplishment to give yourself value, that, that's a time limit on that one. Right. Because you can't keep up forever. And you certainly can't do everything perfectly forever. Right. And so it's, it's a very difficult game to play. And people do. They, they do it all the time. And, and it gets to the point where they actually have to limit their exposure to other people in order to maintain that pride because everything's always a threat. Right. And so they surround themselves with yes men. They surround themselves with a very confined, insulated kind of environment where nobody's ever a threat to their very fragile sense of purpose and meaning. Uh, we talked about this a, a bit in uh, season one how when you're living in relation to the world, in terms of everything you think about yourself, you're never free. You can never be free. And so I just wanted to take a moment here because we're about an hour in and uh, we didn't mention this at the beginning of the episode as we're trying to do more often, but uh, coming up, Andrew and I are going to be meeting in person for the very first time. We're not saying what the date is, but it's coming up very soon. It actually could already be happening. You don't know. And if you'd like to know, then you're going to have to join us on Patreon for $5 a month. You get access to three live group sessions with us Every month, you can chat with us directly, ask us questions, or just shoot the breeze. Um, you get access to Andrew's ebook, my ebook, but you're also going to get access to the behind the scenes footage of when we meet. We're going to tell you the date that it's happening. We're going to let you know everything that's going to be involved with that. You're going to get a front row seat at the very first time. Dualistic Unity is going to be sitting in the same environment together. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. So if you want to join us, Join us at patreon.com slash dualistic unity and you will get all of the updates as we approach that date. Again, unless it's already happened. 
I'm not going to tell you. You're going to have to join us on Patreon. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited for that to come out, whether or not it's been filmed yet or not. <laughs> Trying to be as secretive as we can, but um, yeah, yeah. Going back to the the pride, the feelings of pride, and, and the idea of doing everything perfectly too. I see that, and it's like. If you think you have to do everything perfectly and have to maintain this image of perfection, there's no opportunity for growth. Like you have to be willing to suck ass at something for a while. If you're willing, if you want to grow, if you want to do things differently. And, and the beauty of that too, is like, sometimes I like thinking of things kind of like a video game with that. It's like another sort of attribute that you've never worked on that you can grow. And, and it all, overlaps and it all crosses over so it's all impacting each other and even the mentality of having the i don't know what the word is but the ability to not be perfect and to fail the ability to be able to do that for yourself is you growing just that in itself not even giving yourself that in order to then grow just that recognition itself is growth and that will impact everything else because all of a sudden in everything that you're doing, when you do improve at something, it doesn't matter how someone views it or what, how someone judges you because you're not basing yourself off your idea of yourself and self-perception off of someone else's idea or self-perception anymore. So it's, it's impacting everything all the time and every recognition that you have is impacting things both both ways like every action that we take has consequences towards unity or or away from unity towards who we think we are or the recognition that we're not what we think we are like all of those things are cumulative and they they impact every single thing that we do no matter what action we're taking whatever field that we're in it all derives benefit from those recognitions it's it's like a all-encompassing recognition that is applicable to anything you go through in life as life yeah which is why uh, one of my earliest videos <laughs> spiritual fact for the day because every once in a while I'll, I'll pop one of those out was that there are no levels in spirituality, just directions. There's two, towards yourself and away from yourself. That's it, right? And, and that's, there's no levels because that implies that you can't just randomly skip to any other period in that variation, right? And that's another thing in power versus force that they, they've talked about that while most people won't rise by more than one to five points in their entire existence, there are others who will jump by hundreds of points in a single day just through something or through some insight. So it's, it's consistently changing. And, and where a lot of people make the mistake of looking at that book and going, oh, I'm at level 175 or I'm at level 100, right? Is that that's not how that works, right? Every state of mind has its own energy level. It's not you as a whole. It's you, the state of mind you are right now and now and now and now and then you can kind of average that out to get an idea of where you are most of the time but it's always in flux which is why a lot of people walked away from that book going well i am at a solid 210 or i'm an acceptance it's like no you're still under under pride um i don't know if you've noticed that right but but it's because we want to define ourselves immediately and that's what cuts us off underneath 200 it cuts us off under courage right like you have to be willing. I've said this before that awareness or freedom is very unsatisfying egotistically. There's nothing you can take away from it in terms of this adds to my value, right? Like I do things all the time. I'll tackle new challenges. I'll, I'll tackle things that I have really no expectation of succeeding at. And I usually succeed nonetheless, because I don't tell myself I can't do it. And then somebody will say, well, you gotta be proud of yourself. I'll be like, no, not really right? It's like, what do you mean? You're not proud of yourself. It's like, I hadn't even entered into my head throughout this entire process. Like my, my role within this is almost irrelevant to it getting done. Right. And it's so weird because people don't 
don't understand because they're still looking at themselves as the, the idea being the source of energy. And once you, re, once you start to take in the fact that the idea is the weight that drags your energy down, well, everything starts to change, right? But then there's no certainty in that. You have to continue on without going, and now I'm this. And that's the habit, right? Yeah, it's crazy how someone who's looking at those levels, if they do start defining themselves based on a level, it's like they're going to drop in levels inevitably. It's so funny. And the recognition that it's the same recognition that you are right now. It's like you are only right now ever. You're not the past. You're not what you're going to become. It's like you are the awareness of what is here and now. And so in that, there could be an embodiment of certain levels or a certain level, but in that action, in that moment, and then there are other moments that may act in different, a different level. And so it's not even like, it's like that the levels as interesting as it is to have the levels, they're totally irrelevant. And if you are defining yourself or like utilizing it or like checking it every day to be like, where am I at today? It's like that you're just going to see yourself. You're actually watching the thing. It's just going to start dropping because you're, you're defining yourself as you go. And it's like the judgment isn't necessary. Your opinion is irrelevant as Ray has said many times. And it's so true that you don't have to judge yourself in every situation. You are yourself. Just be and see what happens and recognize that you're not the story and you're just what is. And then there's so much more to that freedom in not having to try to be something or remember how to be something or even doing things like affirmations is, is like taking yourself. I mean, you're doing it in the moment as the moment, but it's like you're kind of building up this idea of yourself that, I don't know. I feel like affirmations typically are like future focused in that they're like for the benefit of future self that you are these things and you're going to be these things because you're telling yourself that you are these things. So you say them at night so that the next day you're going to be that. And it's like, you are it, right? Like that's it. There's so many like, and there's so many people who, I don't know, think they recognize that. And then they go down paths of ego and identity, like so much of it. And I don't know, even the people who say that they recognize it, but then that they are also, you know, a spirit existing, experiencing a human or the universe experiencing a human is like, no, you're just the universe verse like you you're in this form yeah like I, I I'm not gonna discount that but it's like this form is the universe you're not the universe that is like this idea of like a a big energy field that you pick apart a little piece and place it in this human it's like no the human is the universe this it is life itself like there's no separation there's so with people who say that you are a spirit experiencing human, like that is so dualistic and it's so separate that like, oh, so this human isn't this human being like flesh and everything isn't also it. It's like this inherent separation between what you think you are and your experience and this human. It's like, they're all parsed out and it's all, there is no separation. It's all it. And you're all it experiencing yourself from this perception that happens to be shaped in a human as a human. Thank you for saying shaped in a human, because I'm not even a big fan of the word human because I am not my form, right? Like you identify me through my form. You identify this voice through the form that it, it uh, originates from. Right. But th the form doesn't, isn't the source of, of the voice. It might be the instrument the voice is played through, but the source is the awareness of the universe. It is the universe, right? And there is no division whatsoever, which goes back to what we were saying about eating animals or eating plants, 
Uh, there's no difference if you really want to think about it, right? Everything is, is just me. And if you're eating something, that being, that consciousness, that awareness, that body is now a part of you. So the thing you just ate has become part of you. So did, it, did its spirit evolve or is it always just the same spirit doing the rotation, keeping existence alive? Right. And, and that's it is that we want to divide it. And it's like we said earlier, it's an insight that is only limited by our willingness to let go of our self-imposed limitations. Right. And so if I want to settle on human, I'm going to say I'm a spiritual being having a human experience. Right. I'm not having a human experience. My experience is way too weird and awe-inspiring to be only human. Like, and I've got to say, because the amount of things that we are consciously able to tap into, we've talked about this previously in terms of like imagination and dreams, just, just to mention them on the superficial level. That's way beyond like just an organic being, right? Like when you think about it, when you think about the complexity of that experience, that, that goes way beyond like just, just gray matter in your skull. Like there's, there's a whole universe of things within your awareness. Like that's, that's awe-inspiring in a way that until you start to recognize that a human being isn't just the brain, right? Like life at its most fundamental basic level, like let's just talk about a single cell, okay? Is aware, has its intelligence. A cell is gonna do what it can to, to survive, right? A uh, more complex uh, entity, say, I don't know, a raccoon, is made up of a bunch of cells. And each of those cells in increasingly complex systems to make different organs, to make different uh, biological functions within that raccoon. But each of those cells are once again, alone and isolated and experiencing reality on their own. And then the raccoon as a complex entity made up of all of those, those cells is also alone experiencing itself as the raccoon. Well, you'll just look at the complexity of a human body, of the human brain, of all of the things that are in this form. And there's a lot, everything on this planet is involved in the creation of this form. Then it seems really superficial to go, I'm a human being and just label it at that. Like it just seems so superficial and so limiting to not recognize that the complexity of this form is allowing me to access greater and greater complex insights. That's amazing. So I'm not the form, the form is just the lens that I can perceive the vastness of myself with. I'm not the form. Yeah, that, that recognition helps a lot, but uh, it's, it's just so deeply ingrained in so many of us. And something else, uh, I, I can't remember where I heard it or what video it was in, but it was talking about the idea that atoms, like the atoms that make up this body are billions of years old and the energy and just the idea of how energy can't be created or destroyed. So, so that's very interesting. So with these, the atoms that make up Andrew, is that something that is passed through more recently, like my family tree, like Andrew's family tree, is that where it, it passes through or where do these atoms come from more recently? Like, I guess in this universe, was it all from the big bang? Was that where the atoms and like, as it's expanding, if energy can't be created or destroyed, how are the atoms, are new atoms being created? No. Okay. So then is it expanding? That's the thing, right? Like the atoms are just changing form, right? They're, they're just changing how they're expressed, right? There's even a theory that it's all one atom <laughs> that's expressed differently, interacting with itself, right? That's outside of time and space and that that's what the universe is. And, and so it really comes down to like, when you say the atoms that make up Andrew, which Andrew, because you know, all, all the molecules in your body are replaced every several years, right? Like everything within you gets changed constantly, right? They're not ever the same atoms, which really begs the question about DNA, 
right? Like, hold on, if all my atoms are changing, what is my DNA doing? What's the role there, right? And especially when you start looking at the research into uh, DNA and RNA and the fact that RNA is actually um, receiving a non-local consciousness as a signal. So there's this theory in the scientific community that our awareness is being pulled through the receptor that is our DNA and then filtered through our brain. So we are in a field of consciousness. It's not created in here. And our DNA is the receptor, just like a, a radio, right? An antenna on a radio. On a radio. And, and that is where our DNA gets all of its information from because our DNA and our RNA tells our body what it's supposed to do, when it's supposed to do it. And we still don't understand how, like we don't understand how our DNA suddenly goes, and this is where your nails start to grow. Oh, and this is where your hair starts to turn color. And this is what color your eyes are going to be, right? Like if our DNA is changing, if, if our atoms are changing and all that, and we have these consistent changes, that implies again, that there is more of a pattern going on than just our biological pattern, than just us individually. Almost like we're the energetic expression or an extension of the universe. And so my perspective, of all of this, the way I, I tend to view it, is that we are energetic soup, consistently put into the form of a human being, <laughs> moment to moment to moment to moment. But the consistency of that human being is largely dependent on the consistency of our own limitations and our thoughts. I truly do believe that because I've seen myself in my life go through numerous uh, physical problems in terms of illnesses and whatnot in the past none of which exist anymore, right? For the most part, like I'm still dealing with glaucoma, as far as I know, um, I actually haven't had that tested in a little while, but the, the point is, is that most of my other health problems have gone away. And I was told they would be lifelong problems. And the only thing that's changed is me, right? And as I've changed, so have my habits and so have the things that I've done in my life, which people would say, oh, well, that's where, that's where the health improvements came from. It's like, mm, see, I would disagree. Right, because the health improvements spawned the changes in my lifestyle, not the other way around. Yeah, I kind of forget sometimes that our atoms are changing all the time. Like, is there a consistency in, in how long they are? I guess it's got to be a constant thing. It's not like every three, three years, it's just like they all shed and then like a new body is created. You know, is it through mostly through? like the shedding of the skin is that, or is it just like everything? That's a really good question, right? Because energy is always in flux, right? Energy is always in flux. Atoms are constantly going back and forth through us all the time. It's radio waves, Wi-Fi signals, all of this stuff, right? So there's energy floating around back and forth, regardless of, of the fact that we may see a consistent cell, that cell is always changing as well right? So it really just comes down to how solid are we? <laughs> exactly, exactly how unchangeable is this body? Which goes back to what we were talking about earlier. How much influence do we have over versus how much influence does it have over us, right? And as we start to break down this barrier between the observer and the observed, it really becomes an interesting question and, and one that you can't get to the bottom of. I mean, this is the practice that, that most people put into like yoga or tai chi or martial arts, right? The farther you go down this, the greater your abilities tend to be, the greater your, your capacity for those arts tend to be. And it's because there's less and less of you in the way there's greater and greater sensitivity, there's greater and greater empathy, especially in martial arts. We've talked about this before. Like if you go into a fight, defining yourself egotistically, you could do really well in that fight. But if the other person isn't, and they're aware of what you're doing and you're, you're you know, uh, rehearsing everything in your head, you've already scripted how this is gonna go based on how awesome you are and everything else, that fight's gonna go badly for you. And it's because somebody is actually in it and the other person's not, right? And it's the same is true for our body. Like, so I mentioned this uh, conversation I think we had last week on our live uh, show on TikTok, which unfortunately didn't record. Um, I have been working on improving uh, my left side, because I, I got into a bus accident when I was younger, and, and there was a bunch of other uh, injuries that happened over time. And so I just kind of let that be 
figuring that was my lot in life. And then as I started letting go of this idea that, you know, I'm always going to suffer through this, blah, blah, blah. I started doing other things to work on those muscles. And it wasn't, it wasn't an overnight success. I've been at this for like three or four years, just in small, small variations, but it's always inspired by me reminding myself, I don't know, I'm going to grow up with this problem. And so as I question that, I do a little bit more, right? And as I question that, I find other exercises. I start learning new things, start looking at muscle groups that I've never looked up before, things like that, because I'm not telling myself it's not possible. And all of a sudden, my body is changing, right? And not only is my body changing, but my physiological responses to stress is changing, right? My responses to everything is changing. And so I would have to say that that is having a big impact on me on every level. And unfortunately, we just don't know how to test how much our consciousness is affecting the action of our, of our cells and our DNA. Like this, this is not a conversation that we can have yet, mostly because we don't understand our consciousness, right? Like you can, if they were to do a study, they would just, you know, bring in a, a, test, a test group, sit them down, ask them to think about certain things and then test the physiological responses. But there's no measurement there of that person's level of clarity. Right? Or that level of that person's level of potential energy, as Hawkins would describe it in Power Versus Force, which is why I enjoyed the Power Versus Force book was because what he was saying is that the body actually does know where you are energetically at any given point, and that there's a way to ask it a yes or no question to identify like you're in anger, you're in apathy, you're, you're, you're in pride, you're in anything, yes or no, and the body will go weak or strong according to the answer. And I found that to be really, really interesting, but again, not always consistent. There were times when the scale was actually reversed and it was largely because of that person's overcommitment to their self-identity. Yeah, just the recognition through everything and the idea that you don't have to have an expectation for everything that you go through and recognizing that you don't know how something is going to go and seeing that as a uh, I don't even want to say positive because it's not like positive or negative but feeling seeing that as an opportunity to see things more clearly and and in having expectations it's like you're limiting the potential of that opportunity and for the ability to express intelligence in the moment in the maximum potential way, I guess, is a way of, of stating it. And with expectations just comes limitations. And because you don't know what is possible, you think you do, but all of those thoughts and expectations are based on things that have happened already. It's always going to be Based, whether you're afraid of it or you're excited for it, that expectation of how it's going to go is based on only things that you know, and you don't know what you don't know. So being able to relax into uncertainty gives you the opportunity for growth as well, because with going into something with an expectation, like, and I've been able to do this more a lot more recently, just when I have a new experience or something like not having an expectation gives me like I can feel more free in it and gives me the opportunity to actually be the situation and be more one with it as opposed to experiencing it and having that lack of expectation. It, like there's so many reasons to not have expectations for things besides just, you know, without expectations, there's no disappointment. It's like without expectations, there's also the opportunity for growth. And that is, I guess, just as much benefit as, as thinking, you know, not being able to be disappointed if you don't have expectations, but, you know, with expectations, it's like, they're so unnecessary for everything and they just limit. And while you're expecting it, say beforehand, you are limiting your experience of experiencing what you're going through in that moment. So relaxing into uncertainty, there's so many layers to it. And expectation is a huge one because I think we naturally want to expect 
certain things to be a certain way, whether it's subconscious or not, or I guess a lot of it is probably rooted in subconscious, especially when it's, I guess, either way, but when it's, when it's in the state of fear or, or worry, it's like an expectation of it going poorly. And because in the past, maybe it has, but it goes both ways and just relaxing into, I don't know. I don't know how this is going to go and nothing that has happened leading up to it has to have an impact on how it goes now. But as long as you do cling to what's happened before, even if it's a positive experience, then you expect it to go positively. Maybe it will, but then it's also that you won't, that it won't have as much of a chance to go differently. And therefore you won't have as much of a chance to grow and, and see things from a different perspective. But yeah, I, I don't know where that started from either, but I feel like I've been doing that a few times today, but anyway, yeah. That's okay. that's well, it goes back to what you were talking about um, regarding energy and, and our atoms being replaced and, and all of that stuff. Like how much does our consciousness affect our physiology? Right. And people would say, well, your DNA is set. That's it. Right. But people will also tell you once you're diagnosed with cancer, that's it. And there have been many people who have defeated cancer without chemotherapy. There have been numerous documented cases of people beating cancer simply by changing their life. And often in those situations, it wasn't one life change. It wasn't just changing what they ate. It was changing their circle of friends. It was changing what they did as a job. It was changing their lifestyle, their priorities, changing their relationships. It was in a whole plans of their being where they had to question everything in order to start from scratch. And Krishnamurti often talked about the difference between a river that's running versus a pool off to the side, which is stagnate, stagnated and becomes murky and full of you know, unpleasant things because it's just stagnant. There's nothing in there. There's no change. There's no fluidity. And if that isn't a perfect image of our body in decay, nothing is. And so it really makes you wonder if our health is very much influenced by our, uh, how much we flow versus how much we stagnate energetically. And, and if our body is showing that physiologically in terms of like stress halts your immune system or stress causes your muscles to seize up or, or anything like that, then maybe those responses that we can visually see are indicative of an energetic change that we currently don't know how to measure. Yeah, that's very interesting. The idea of the river and the pool made me think of like a river is, is flowing like constantly it's, it's, there's very, at least in, when you're in a condensed time period, there's very little chance that it's going to dry out or anything like the external impact on it is very little, but if you settle into a pool, you can very easily dry out or very easily overflow based on the environment. It's like the environment is having so much impact on that pool. So if you get caught up in stagnating and thinking you are just this idea, it's like the external is going to be so easily, so easily sway that existence of that pool. Whereas when you're in the river, it's like, there's very, you're just, you're just flowing. There isn't as much idea of self that is to be stagnant. then it's like when you're in the flow and recognize that you are the river and you are the flow, there's just so much more ease to it. It just continues. It keeps going. And it isn't as impacted by everything around it because it doesn't derive such value in that external. So I guess the main point was just like, there's going to be so much less impact on the, from the external when you don't have as much of an idea of yourself and you're just flowing with things. Whereas it's going to be a constant thing when you are stuck in that mentality. For sure. I mean, even just look at uh, some of the, the quote unquote miracles that are actually documented, like of a, of a 120 pound mom whose baby was trapped in a car, suddenly being able to lift that car up and get her baby out, like things like that. Like, these are moments where people aren't defining themselves. They're not thinking about what they can or cannot do. It's just what needs to be done. And that's it. Like they're just the instrument of things happening now. And, and that's all. And, and that is a state of mind that 
again, it's freedom, but it's difficult when you're not prepared for it because we're not raised for it. We're not raised to have faith in ourselves for lack of a better way of saying it, right? We're, we're, we're raised to judge ourselves and keep ourselves in line and measure ourselves up to our idea of everybody else and live up to certain expectations that are taught to us and, and, and so on and so forth. And everybody else is so caught up in that that they just assume their job is to teach us how to live that way, right? And, and so as we start to question that, as we start to, to go beyond that, as we start to become the adults that are, are talking to our younger versions now, we're having a, a different impact. We're actually able to create a different ripple so that way younger parts of us, younger expressions of us are growing up in, a, in an environment where this conversation is happening, where this conversation is available for them to join regardless of all the people around them saying, no, that's not a real thing. You're, you, what are you, a hippie? Or are you just, you know, any of these, these derogatory judgments based on their own fear and their own limitations. Now there are people that they, they can come to and they can go, these people are talking about it. They look normal enough. Like they're not out there, you know, sitting on a soapbox saying the end is near or anything like that. Like they're totally being reasonable. In fact, they're telling me I can do anything. Why wouldn't I want to talk to, to them? That's the point. Because for the longest time, anybody who started to wake up, what do, you, what do you get? Snake oil salesmen, right? Ambulance chasers. What's that? You're having an existential crisis. I have answers for you. It's only this much per month for the rest of your life, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the point is that uh, we keep changing. We are the river flowing, right? That's the funny part. Like we've, we've had hit a couple of snags here and there. Our history as humanity is, is nothing else but like a... a log jam on the river as it were right but we're building up pressure and we're starting to blow that jam right out of the water and we're starting to see some flow again and it's just keeping it going within yourself within yourself because that's all that you are everything right and this is why i say i am not a human being i am the representation of everything and so are you which means everything that you do is everything that i do wrap your head around that one yeah, it's it's nice how much more clearly I can see that now because I think even when we started the podcast, it was like when you would say I I am you is like Ray and Andrew, and it's it's just def recognizing that you aren't what you think you are. You aren't this identity and story, and in that, there's the opportunity for so much more faith in yourself, and there just the idea and looking at faith in yourself is like, there's so many societal constructs that promote the lack of faith in yourself. It's unbelievable. Like every major construct is like, whether it's religion is like, no, you, you can't do it yourself. You need all of these other things or nationalism, big government is like, no, you can't do all these things on your own. You need us. You need, need big daddy government or uncle Sam or whatever words you want to use. So there's so many things in our society that, that push us away from the recognition of unity, that it's like, we're, I don't know. I don't want to say fighting the current because there's not, <laughs> It's I, unless the current is ego I, identity and, and thinking, going back to, I guess, the idea and, and the sort of diagram I was thinking of before when we were talking about how like the obvious point of unity to two points to, you know, four to eight, to 16 to 32, whatever. And it's like the further out you go, it's like the more or if you think of it like branches almost, it's like once you get to that, you know, 10th degree, it's, you have to recognize so many, it's like, it, it's a farther path of recognition or remembering. And the further out you get, the more structures that are built on the recognition or the, the thought that you're not unity, that which only reaffirms all of, the people's mentalities who can't, who don't see the unity. So it's interesting. And it's like kind of weird to think that we can still recognize unity be with this much duality 
going on or, or perception of duality going on everywhere all around us do you think with even just humanity because humanity really relative to everything ah, it's, that's weird even saying like relative to everything isn't that old because it's like that's using time to yeah. perceive oldness and it's like <laughs> eternal eternity is right now but mm, yeah shit i just like twisted up my own mind mm -hmm. thinking i was i was thinking of like humanity from this quote unquote start of humanity was it easier to recognize unity then versus now but it's like that that is a perception of like past and future and on um, utilizing the illusion of time as well so it's like i don't even know if i can ask that question. well what's worse is we can't even stop at humanity right because if you look at humanity humans are just you know a variation or a continuation of the form that came before it right and if the form came before it was more simplistic then it was closer to unity right because animals are so even our progression into human form has been a progression into the dual into duality has been a progression into farther and farther forms of division because human being human gave us the ability to self conceptualize to greater degree right so we almost had to become human in order to experience this part of duality so do you think more complex beings are the could it be related the idea of duality and that we are separate and the evolution into something as complex as humans like the combined mentality of duality manifests in a physical form that is more complex expressing more duality as opposed to like a single celled organism versus something as crazy complex as humanity and then the idea of the human brain is just like another crazy level or addition or, or perception of division in the dualistic spectrum, I yeah, guess. Absolutely. That's exactly what we are. We are a greater and greater symbolism of duality, right? Which is why when you look at the synapses in our brain, what does, what does it look like? It looks like the universe. Damn. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Holy shit. That's so wild to think that we are expressions, like physical expressions of a state of being that we also, for the most part, embody. So I guess that makes sense then to even think of, you know, how animals don't really probably don't have much of a perception of past and future. They're always just where they are in the present without thinking so much. So it's like, and they are for the most part, sim simpler beings than or expressions of unity than humans. So it's like the more, dualistically we are expressed the more dualistic we feel and the more dualistic we act it's like so are, is it just going to keep going until it like self implodes or just like resets or something because like or could you is there a chance that we counteract the expression of duality to a mentality of you more of a mentality of unity and then but then would our form follow the expression of unity or mentality of unity and would humans get simpler or or just expressed differently right because it's not like we're abandoning our awareness of duality in order to accomplish that unity right and so our the the um, complexity of our physical expression would have to change which is why i am always very curious when i hear aliens being described as beings of light right or i hear about you know alien spacecraft possibly being interdimensional it's like oh 
maybe it's not physical in the way that we think we are, right? But this is the whole reason I say, I don't identify as a human being, right? I identify as an incredibly complex, dualistic expression of a unitary universe, right? And that's it. But that, that begs the question again, of what's possible? What happens as we get this? Like what happens as our mentality changes to our form, right? And, and how far does that go? Because I mean, it, it, right now we're just talking about the biological on this planet throughout its timeline. We're not talking about the creation of the solar system itself or the fact that that is also an expression of duality, which will inevitably end up being a supernova, which will go back to a black hole. So there's another pattern of unity to duality to unity that we are fitting within. Cycles within cycles, just like the episode we had in season one. Yeah, there's so much of it. And like the ideas of fractals existing throughout nature and how many things like the way universes look from our perception of it at such a large scale to a tiny little speck and oh man just just the idea that this is all my dream and it's even it's hard to conceptualize the vastness of it and how little we know and it's so funny to hear people talk about like the limitations of the universe or like the known universe and it's like literally in saying that it's like why even stop why do we conceptually stop there you know or think that the big bang was like the beginning we equate that to like the beginning of existence and the edge of the known universe is like somehow separate from the rest of it because that's all that we can measure like what just because your measuring tape's only 10 feet long doesn't mean that you know distance stops there and well, especially when you uh, consider that we're not even seeing things that exist anymore when you start looking long, far enough right like when we start looking out into the universe we're not seeing things that exist anymore we're seeing light that disappeared millions of years ago that's still traveling here so we're looking back at the past damn but and it's like okay but then we're seeing it now so is it the past and even the idea that oh that light ha doesn't exist anymore but like it does also so it's like does it not exist anymore if we're fucking seeing it you know like people because i've heard that so many times that oh yeah that's just still traveling to us and it's like okay well that's as real as the dream that i'm experiencing here and now it's as real as anything right now yeah our atoms are also 99 percent empty space does that mean that i perceive 99 percent empty space in this dualistic illusion like not really so yeah i don't know just this shit's crazy. It's <laughs> uh. the reason I always, I'm always just dumbstruck when somebody's like, oh, it's all pretty straightforward. There's nothing really. Keep questioning. It's like, no, 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 you just, you just don't want to. And that's okay. Like, I understand. I understand. I really do. Because every insight that I've ever had that was worth having required me to sacrifice something. It required me to sacrifice some degree of comfort or some degree of certainty. It required me to sacrifice who I used to be. And if you think you are that person, then that is terrifying. That is terrifying. But it's the recognition that you're not that person that allows you the freedom to just put it down from time to time, just to recognize it's not the truth. Um, I can't tell you how many times I, I received this message from people and it, it's heartbreaking to me because what we're trying to describe isn't a concept. We're, we're discussing um, an unfolding state of being that exists and is constantly accessible in abandoning self-concept. And in trying to communicate that, we always have to use 
concept. There's no way around this. And so I'll have people message me and go, one day I'll get this. And that makes me very sad. And it's because we're trying so very hard to communicate. There is no this to get. There's no you to get that's going to set you free. It's the recognition that you are free until you hold on to an idea of you. Until there's something to get to, you are whole. That's the most difficult thing in communicating this, is that we have to use concepts to describe what it's like to be beyond concepts. So for anybody who's listening to this, recognize that the best thing you can do for your own growth is just to sit in it until you become aware of it, right? Don't label it, don't judge it, don't try to pin it down to any particular answer or conclusion. Just allow yourself to be unfolding forever and it will consistently change your life. Yeah, just the idea that there's there's nowhere to get, like, or that there is no you to get it. Like, I I am someone who gets it. It's like, or same thing as I had an ego death. It's like it's so interesting, and and it reminds me of my experience when I was tripping this weekend. I took three grams, and it was like it was so. I so quickly go to, because there's so much, so little sense of self. It's so like, I was just lying down, just like traveling through the universe. I felt like I was, you know, the images where you're kind of like in a tunnel through the universe. I was just doing that, just like riding this. And I was with a friend and, and, uh, they're like, you know, how, how are you feeling? I was like, I am, I've been in so many different universes. It's incredible. And it was just, it was so clear. I don't know. And it's interesting how our perception just plays a role. Like we can perceive things however we want. And as I was doing that, I was kind of seeing it as life just being this ride. And I was just on this ride and there was no, right or wrong thing that was happening. There was no good or bad. It was just experience after experience, one thing leading to another with no separation. So there is nothing leading to anything else. It's just what is happening right now. And, and we're just experiencing it. We're just along for the ride. And, and there's so much clarity in the recognition that there isn't anywhere to get and there isn't anything to accomplish that isn't right now. And there isn't any you that isn't right now. There isn't any idea of you that isn't right now. Like that's, that's it. That's all you ever are. All you ever will be. All you ever have been is right now. And there's just so much more freedom in that. And and it, it just snowballs on itself from being something where you, you hear about how to deal with situations and, and get over situations. It's like in that mentality, there's no longer situations to get over because unless they're right now, there isn't that is what is. So the situation that happened yesterday that you're still mulling over, like it no longer exists. It isn't your reality anymore so there isn't anything there and that is where you know the applicability comes in it's like you don't need these tools to like oh you can stop thinking about it because like you can't change it or whatever like i say that sometimes but it's it's like it doesn't exist if it's not right now and as a concept people a lot more people get that but in the recognition it's like there's so many layers and it's so deep in that recognition that you are nothing more than right now nothing more and nothing less forever but i can't recognize that as long as i have a narrative because my narrative exists in time so i'm immediately bringing time with me into the here and now as soon as i'm holding on to my story which is really really interesting when you think about it it's like oh huh so the past that I'm perceiving is dependent on the narrative I'm holding on to, which is exactly the case 
because all of your memories are skewed by your current perception of yourself. <laughs> so it's absolutely true that the, the time you perceive is dependent on the fiction of yourself that you're holding on to. So that's always a lot of fun, right? The less of you there is, the less time there is, right? It's all just one unfolding moment as me without anything around that me, right? Which is what we were talking about, about you know the, the Hare Krishna thing, where it's like Hare, the recognition of the illusion, me versus Krishna being Godhead, the actual reality as it is. And that's what all of this is about, which is why, again, we, we talk about religion and belief. We talk about how so many things are on that spectrum of away from yourself or towards yourself. And then it becomes wrapped up in a concept. It becomes wrapped up in a belief. Now it's something that people have to do a certain thing to get to a certain place, right? Other than what they already are, where they already are, when they already are, right? And that's the beautiful thing about what we're talking about. You could go back and talk to that gentleman that you met last weekend and just sit and talk and resonate with every insight that he's ever had and never once have to define yourself as being a member of the Hare Krishnas. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I just can't overstate how much freedom there is in that. It's almost hard to describe, you know, in, in words, in dualistic language, because it's just like, it's, it's applicable to everything all the time. Like we, there's so many things like thinking back on the past that I've experienced and all the struggles that I've had have been rooted in the idea of myself as a certain thing in a certain way. And I've only ever been right now. I just, you think that you're not, you think that you're something else. And without those thoughts, I actually, <laughs> so without those thoughts, there isn't anything to cling to anymore. But I had a, I had a conversation uh, this weekend. There was this, this company that help me with my ebook and stuff that I kind of work with. Um, they were in town. They hosted like a creator party on Friday. And on Thursday, I went out to dinner with uh, the CEO and founder who also does TikTok stuff. He's, he's pretty young. I think he's, I don't know, maybe 28 and four of the employees. It's a very small like startup. I think they only have 10 or so employees anyway. But so the five of us went to dinner and um, one, two of them follow me and they've, they really like my content and stuff. And, and, but it was interesting how it was three females and then John is the CEO and founder. Um, and they all have sort of different ideas about spirituality, religion, and one of them, it was, this was actually pretty funny and I, I got lucky, but one of them was like, so I'm assuming none of you, no one else is religious here. And I thought they were coming at it from like, they're not religious, assuming everyone else isn't religious, but they were religious and they were just assuming that no one else was. And I was like, no, no, I'm not. And cause I thought that they weren't religious, but they were. And then they were like, okay, yeah. Cause so I guess I'm the only Christian here. And I was like, oh, and, and I kind of made a joke and I was like, oh, I thought you meant you weren't religious and you were confirming that no one else was. I'm glad I didn't say what immediately came to mind. Cause I was like, in my head, I was like, oh, fuck no. And that would have just like, <laughs> I don't know, caused a whole other thing, but she had a very, uh, rational perspective kind of like she was able she kind of defended it but also recognized that it was kind of uh, like there was a lot of cognitive dissonance and she for her it came down to like she has experienced miracles which she refused to talk about because she said they were very personal and that is why she knows there is a god and another one was talking about how they went to a channeler and they were having past life regression and you're on this whole spiel. And I was just like sitting there very quietly, like, and, uh, and then everyone kind of turns to me after 
and they were like, Andrew, I feel like you, uh, you got your body language is telling me you got some things to say about this. And like a lot of them, a couple of them followed me. So they knew that I was probably like, this is, this is not bullshit, but like blown out of proportion. So immediately I'm just like, well, all right. Yeah. Yeah. I have some things to say and I'll start with this. There is no past and future and you don't exist. So in that, it's like, like you are everything that's ever been and their time and space aren't, or I, I also said time and space are an illusion. The past and future don't exist and you don't exist. So that idea of, of a past life regression is very much rooted in the idea that past and future do exist. Time exists, space exists, separation exists, but they at the same time recognize that like, we're all one blah, blah, blah. So it's clearly conceptual and not actually recognizing that. And I went into, I broke it down. I was like, so if you, the, the idea of you, right. The idea of whatever her name was, doesn't exist, then there is no bounds to your identity. Right. She was like, yeah. And I kind of broke it down like that, where she confirmed everything I was saying, but still. And, and so I was like, so there's no bounce to your identity without any bounce to your identity. There is no one else without anyone else. There is no separation, which I've already said without any separation, there is no, and no past and future. And right now being eternal, there is no time. So really you are everyone and everything that's ever existed in all of those recognitions, it's just kind of like, there's no other way for it to be. It couldn't be any otherwise in those recognitions. And that's when, which this, it didn't, I, I saw this more clearly, the idea of people saying like, oh, well, everyone has a right to believe what they want to believe. And they, they kept saying that, oh, they all had like different sort of spiritual beliefs and ideas and, and beliefs in certain like manifestation practices. And they were going through all those things and or religious beliefs. And, and they all settled on, like, I I'm okay with any beliefs, like all beliefs are, are great. And I, I was not gonna admit that. And I was like, well, I don't, you know, have anything against any individual beliefs. It's really just belief in, in general. And if you recognize those things, there's a whole shitload of cognitive dissonance to cling to those things because if you actually recognize them, you can't have both. And so sure you can have cognitive dissonance and believe in all those other things, but you can't also recognize that we're all the same thing. If you want to believe all of those things, because if we're not all the same thing, there is no actual you besides a story that's an illusion. And so all that shit crumbles immediately. And it was so fascinating to see that at play and everyone just cumulatively or com com combined settle on the idea that, oh, it's, I'm okay with any belief. And they were all very much just like, believe what you want to believe. It's okay. And it's like, yeah, but you just confirmed all these things that I said. And I went piece by piece. And it's like, you're just denying everything that you just confirmed at the same time. And it was, it was fascinating. I had a ton of fun and some of them got a little frustrated, but I was enjoying it. Yeah. That is awesome. That sounds like a typical day in my life. That's pretty much how it goes. <laughs> right. But it, it really just comes back down to believing is what happens when you lack faith. Right. And, and that's something that people tend to, to misinterpret. They're like, no, belief is faith. No, actually, belief is false security. It's the opposite of faith, right? But this idea that, oh, everybody's going to believe what they want to believe. It's like, yeah, yeah, you are. And you're going to suffer accordingly, right? And then there's nothing else to really say about that. You're welcome to do so. You're eternal. doesn't really matter. I mean, you can suffer your entire life. I'll still be here rocking it. That's fine, right? Because I'm you. Um, but it's just that it's kind of like... Um, like we, we grew up and we learned about uh, reality or God in the same way that children grow up and learn about crayons. And so we've learned to use these concepts and draw crayon paintings 
and we've never graduated to actual paintings, right? Like we, we're still we're still painting in crayon, and and it's because it's simplistic and it makes us feel better and it's easy to do, but it's not letting us find any of that nuance or any of that that additional detail that makes the painting so awe inspiring, right? That makes it so interesting not to just witness but to be a part of as it unfolds, right? And so, yeah, I, I always come back to this idea that. We settle on the superficial. We settle on it because it's easy. You know, even the idea of, of God is, is a superficial assumption, right? And, and it's all like, I've often had this conversation with Christians where they'll say, well, you know, God is outside of reality, just kind of, you know, cr he created reality. It's like, wow, your God is so limited. Like what you're saying is that, you know, God is the player in a chess game, not the pieces or the board which is a super limited perspective of God, especially if you're talking about something that's omnipresent, omnis uh, omniscient, eternal, the whole thing, but no, no, it just sits up there in the bleachers watching for eternity, occasionally dabbling with, with people that it agrees with or doesn't agree with. Like that's a super limited and insecure deity. Yeah, when you when you're able to look at that from like a clearer perspective, it's so fascinating. And well, I'm sure for believers be so frustrating to like actually see it in that way and, and recognize that oh shit, that is a really limited perspective. And like, yeah, oh man. And and even just thinking, yeah, the idea that it's not everything that it's it's just hanging out in a in a kingdom in the clouds watching over just watching everything happen not being able to take part it's like god like come on <laughs> let's uh yeah there's just uh it's it's so uh it's not frustrating but it's just like there's so many things that people settle on and they they settle on answers when they aren't there just to feel better and it's so fucking obvious and it doesn't matter what you say and and that's fine too i guess like in unity expressed infinitely if you want to settle on thinking you know and give yourself a false sense of certainty like you know who am i to stop you but it's just when you see the limitations and see all the suffering, it's like you still are afraid to die. You still judge everything that happens to you all the time. You, you're still afraid of tons of things. You still worry about everything. You're still, you still get angry super easily. It's like, is that idea of, of Sky Daddy really helping you that much when you're suffering and depressed, like half of your existence? Like, come on like god ah yeah. and they don't see that connection they don't they think it's it's not they think it's a separate thing they they, they like compartmentalize that and it's like oh no god is what makes me feel better when i'm going through all this shit it's like maybe the idea of that and all of these things are a little bit more interconnected than you thought well it's kind of like uh being in love with the idea of loving somebody rather than actually loving them it's very much the same thing right it's i love the idea of god but not surrender right i love the idea of heaven not necessarily down with just faith right and and that's it and despite the fact and i know in christianity they'll often tell you like god is beyond our understanding but here's what it is hold on didn't you just say that what you just said implies that we should keep questioning things, not just quote chapter and verse every time a question comes up, but that's their whole bag. Like all the answers are in the Bible, but you just told me God's beyond understanding, but you wrapped it up in a single book. It's pretty good. Yeah. It's just that cognitive dissonance. You see it so much. It's like, it's getting easier for me to pick apart too, which I kind of, enjoy doing it in like a very calm and rational demeanor being able to just look at it like 
and they it was funny at this dinner they were like you know just because you're a better debater doesn't mean that you know that someone else's belief isn't rational it's like you just confirmed that everything you believe is bullshit and then still turned around and chose to believe in it it's like you saw everything you agreed with everything and then you turned around and said nah i'm going to keep doing this it's like it's not a de- it's not about being a good debater like yeah i can articulate i enjoy talking about this stuff so i i enjoy being able to articulate it and just pick things apart and and question it so like yeah because there's the enthusiasm aspect of it like maybe i'll be perceived at being good at it but when you're when you're settling on false certainty and standing on a shaky chair it's like then it doesn't you could be a much better debater than i am but it's you're still standing on a shaky chair and all i have to do is give it a little kick and or ask a little question that you have to answer but by answering it you're you're causing yourself to lose the argument that's it so it's like i'm just not standing on anything shaky like i'm standing on the recognition that i am what is here and now i'm the universe experiencing itself without a story without a no past and future like i'm just right now and like there's so much depth to that like the present moment has become such a fad idea and concept that people think it's just another thing but it's like it's the only thing like that's it and in that recognition there isn't room for belief so that's what it comes down to and and so it's it's not it's pretty simple recognitions with a shitload of depth that's it it's simple not easy okay that's it and and it's a direction which means that it's not the step that you're on right it's everything from the step you're on onwards it's funny i was uh, i was doing some math with my daughter recently and uh, she was learning about rays which i thought was kind of funny and so i learned a new definition for ray which i never knew uh, a ray is everything from its point of origin from the direction onward so it includes everything from the origin to the end of the road, which I thought that was awesome. It really made me laugh in general. Like, yeah, that works out. That, that, that's pretty good in general. Um, but we have to wrap this up because we're over the two hour mark. We just keep going and, and there's just so much to unpack. I was thinking that uh, it might be fun when you come here because it may have happened, may not, but obviously it hasn't because I just said when you come here. And anybody who's made it two hours into this episode, thanks for sticking around. Um, when you come here, we should hit a Bible group. Hell yeah, <laughs> absolutely. That could be a great time. And also, and see, let's time it. See how long <laughs> before we get booted. Uh, like, have you done that before? Have you gone? And like, how does that work? Do you just start asking questions and they just inevitably kind of get pissed off usually? Usually, yeah. Um, it really depends. Like it depends on, on which religion uh, I'll go. Like I, I went to mosques and temples. I went to churches. I've done all that. And um, each religion responds differently. Um, you know, if you want to have a good conversation, go down to a Buddhist temple. Good conversation. You want to piss off a bunch of people go down to a Roman Catholic church <laughs> on a Sunday book drive or something and, and just start talking. Um, yeah, it really just comes down to the conversation, but it's really good. It's good practice because they will try and get you riled up. They will want you to be offended because then they can vilify you and ignore everything that you've said. Right. So the trick is to get into that conversation and just ask, just ask questions, just, okay, well, hold on. I'm just trying to get my mind around this. And avoid if you can mythology avoid the, the theology the theological debate and just stick to what's real right it's like huh that really seems like that's a lack of faith doesn't that seem like i'm building up an idea of something in my head here and just just put holes at the assumptions because as soon as you do that you start to see exactly how how um flawed the belief structure itself is and then you will start to see that cognitive dissonance and you will start to see that that um that upset reaction or that aggressive reaction to to you threatening 
ultimately what is the source of their value and meaning and certainty. And it's not that you're trying to, right? It's just that you don't rely on them. And in that, you kind of imply that they shouldn't be relied on. And it's not intentional by any means, but if I, if I go into a church and they, they go, well, you know, have you found Jesus? My answer is typically, I am Jesus. Like, and, and you can imagine how that, that goes from there, right? And so the conversation will start, well, what do you mean? Oh, that Jesus was the only son. And, and you can just start it from there and have a great time or go to a charity that they're holding, help out for the day. And you can actually see where the belief almost gets left behind. Like I've actually seen Christians who were volunteering at, at a food drive or volunteering to, to raise money or collect clothing for the, for the homeless. And in the entire time that they're there, very rarely are they saying like, go with Jesus, here's a Bible, you know, any of that. They're actually just being caring people. That is when I like to see believers at their best is when they're not necessarily holding on to the belief, but just doing what they want to do out of empathy, almost using the belief as a justification, which is sad in itself, right? And if there's anything that we're doing, the reason that we want to, to raise money and buy a billboard and help people and pay some rent here and there for other people and, and just do stuff like that is to show that you don't need to identify with the belief in order to help reality, in order to see yourself as part of everybody else to act selflessly. It's not something that has to be done in the name of some, you know, omnipotent God. It can be done simply because you recognize that everybody else exists in the same way that you do. Yeah, it's, uh, I think something you said early on was the idea that if you can't think about God, you're, you're not believe. So like, you're not believing in him. And so all believers are non-believers if they're not actively thinking about it. So it's a requirement to remain lost in thought to believe in God, like to believe in Sky Daddy God or anything, any God that is separate from what you're experiencing. But without the need for thought and to be lost in thought, you just experience God. And that is the beauty of it. It's like it is so closely tied to all of our suffering that exists mentally is that's the same thing required in order to believe in sky daddy, which I find just so absolutely fascinating all the time, but I'm definitely, definitely down to, to go to uh, some, a church or two and, and just see what's going on. <laughs> Check That'd it out. Great for sure. Yeah. And, and it's funny because I've said this before, but any God that you have to believe in isn't God. It can't be because it's a creation of your imagination, which is immediately limited. Right. So you have to get out of your own way in order to have that unfolding revelation. Right. That's all it's about is just this unfold, unfolding insight or recognition that everything is connected. There is no separation. That's it. So we're going to wrap up the, uh, the episode here. We're over the two hour mark. Not surprising. There was a lot to unpack in this episode. We do have another guest coming up in the near future. Uh, Roundtable number four is going to be happening uh, next Wednesday. So we'll, we'll make some announcements about that as we get a little bit closer to the date. We do have a free public group Zoom chat this Wednesday uh, at six o'clock Eastern time. You can register for that at dualisticunity.com. That'll be an hour long. We'll just answer some questions and shoot the breeze with everybody. After the fact, we're going to do another hour group chat with our Patreon supporters so you can join us there. The link will be posted on Monday. Um, and as always, if you haven't joined us on Discord, please do. We just actually managed to get over 200 members on the Dualistic Unity Discord server, which is just exciting and amazing considering how many of those members are actively interacting with one another, answering each other's questions, sharing their experiences. And so if you're feeling a bit isolated on your path, if you're feeling like nobody in your reality is, is open to having this discussion with you, then I highly suggest that you join us on Discord because you're not alone. There's quite a few of us. Yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, excited for those group chats on Wednesday is one of my favorite things to do. Uh, and, and the free ones usually bring about a bit of a crowd. So yeah, pump for that and, and pump for our upcoming guests. Very excited. And yeah, everything that's happening on Patreon, it'll all be 
very exciting, very fun stuff. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to it. Me too. And again, the meeting, it's coming soon. I'm super excited because while we have a great rapport over Zoom, virtually, sitting in a room together is going to be a hell of a different experience because as we've talked about through this entire episode, ripples and sensitivity, right? And we, we have a pretty good ability right now to kind of bounce off of one another's insights and, and kind of, you know, float through consciousness as it were. So I'm super curious what's going to happen when we no longer have a mute button or we have to take turns as we're speaking, but we'll actually have some degree of real time interaction with one another. I think that's just going to be a blast. So again, anybody who wants to be involved with that as it comes up, Join us on Patreon. That's the best way. Uh, we'll answer all your questions about when it's happening. We'll let you know how you can chat with us as it happens. And we'll give you a bunch of behind the scene footage that my daughter is going to record while Andrew is here. Um, so we will wrap up this episode here. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We will, of course, see you next week. All right. Bye, everyone.